there's a good chance that if you are a homeowner who happens to have an apple tree in your backyard, or maybe a couple apple trees, that you would look up online someone to help you with that. And that someone would more often than not be Michael Phillips, who wrote two books on the topic. One, The Apple Grower, and two, The Holistic Orchard. For the community of apple aficionados or the homeowner who is just now, only recently, wanting to bring back that apple tree or apple trees that have been long forgotten into a more vibrant state, well, Michael Phillips' work is priceless. And it is with a heavy heart that I say to you in this episode that we are paying tribute because Michael Phillips passed away in his orchard on February 27th, 2022. And in this here episode, we're going to be talking with his good friend, Alan Supernaut, a Brook Farm Orchard in Ashfield, Massachusetts, about the life of Michael Phillips, their friendship, and some definite bonus tips on orchard care that would leave Michael smiling if he was sitting there. And I'll tell you what, we both had a sense that he was. Hey, hey, hey. My name is Rhea Wincaller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. Good apple cheer to all the new folks who are clicking into Cider Chat for the first time. And for all the regular listeners, I'm, I'm, uh, well, I'm waving to you right now, thinking about where you are right now in the orchard or in your car or on your bike or all those good things. Uh, and I want to say, if you're thinking, man, this sounds like a really sad episode to me. I don't know if I would be able to do it. Well, let me first say, yeah, it is freaking sad. Michael Phillips left way too soon. I mean, Damn, the guy was doing so much. It was, it's, a, it's really sad that way. But at the same time, his legacy is undeniably magnificent. What he has left in so many avenues, and specifically for apple trees. Just outstanding. And that's what we're going to be touching on with Alan. Uh, really getting some nice like little tidbits, especially for those, those first-time orchardists and something for well, really for anyone out there who is really keen on growing apples. We're going to get to that chat, and I really see it as a celebration of life, which is really what it's all about when a person passes. So hang in there, and when I return, we got a wee bit of news from Mountain About in Ciderville. I got this photo sent to my phone, and it was a photo of a green bottle with a cork and a dark liquid, and I knew that bottle immediately. I recognized it. I knew exactly where it came from. And underneath was the text, this bottle is an hourglass for our Normandy return, which I love describing a bottle as an hourglass of time. Oh my gosh, it was so, so uh, intriguing. I found out that it was from my friends, Anders and Akina, who both came with me and some other amazing people on the Totally Side of Tour to Normandy in 2018. And we were visiting Philippe, who had a barrel in the back of his cellar, and he was siphoning it out by his mouth into these non-labeled bottles. And we, as many of us as could, brought a bottle back. And I savored that bottle forever. In fact, it's gone now. <laughs> and we returned in 2020 on my own with a very specific goal of bringing more Calvados back from Philippe. In fact, that's from an area uh, of Normandy known as Donfronte. And it's all about the pears there. So the Calvados is made primarily with pears. They say 35% at the minimum as required by the uh, AOC the Appalachian origin, but in essence, it's really like 75% and absolutely magical. So I, I don't mean to tease you here because really you're in luck because I'm headed back to Normandy, to Philippe, to France in September of this year. And so I'd like you to save those two last weeks of September because any day now I should be able to release the details of this tour to you, Ciderville. And I hope that you could come along because we couldn't. 
for a long time. And one thing that we've learned from this pandemic is you don't want to you don't want to miss an opportunity when it happens. So stay tuned for that if you want to get on the list to be notified straight away as soon as it comes out. Send an email to info at ciderchat.com for the upcoming Totally Cider Tour to Normandy and Brittany in September of 2022. Walking through the orchards. Now talk about synchronicity because that same week, only last week, I got another email from my friend David Timmerman, who also went on the Totally Cider Tour to Normandy, France in 2018 with Anders and Akina. I tell you, you know, this is what happens. You get friends forever. And, and he wrote this beautiful little statement about Cider Chat. So I'm going to read it to you. He goes, thank you for continuing to produce an incredibly informative and interesting podcast week after week. I always look forward to hearing from the many awesome people you have on as guests. It's hard to keep track of everything going on around the world, and Cider Chat gives a voice to people out there I may not have heard from otherwise. I especially love the talks when they stray a bit away from cider, like the recent talk you had with Ben Kunish about the chocolate pear. As a fellow tree lover, I've acquired a few seedling sorbus trees. He's talking about sorbus domestica there. And he goes, I'm not certain they will love our Virginia red clay soil, but I think they deserve a chance. Totally, David. I cannot wait to hear. And I bet they're going to do fine. He goes on with, I do want to encourage more listeners to become patrons of Cider Chat. Mm -hmm. Like making cider, producing a weekly podcast takes a lot of work. I receive a ton of value listening every week. And being a patron is my small way of giving some of that value back. Well, that's really kind, David. And of course, anyone out there in Ciderville, if you find value in this podcast, like David Timmerman, you can just check out the Cider Chat Patreon page, which is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Now back to his letter. (laughs) He goes on with, I'm very excited here that you're planning another Cider Tour to Normandy. I feel very fortunate to have gone on the trip to Normandy with you back in September of 2018. We had such an incredible time visiting cider and Calvados producers and trying so many products and tasting the strange apples that we would never have been able to try otherwise. Now, every time I open a bottle of Calvados, the aroma instantly takes me back to the orchard and barrel cellars we visited while we were there. Besides the delicious ciders, poires, and Calvados we drank, we also ate some fantastic meals. I often think about that lunch we had at Manoir d'April, or the pairing dinner with Eric Bordelais. I want to encourage anyone who can make a trip with you to Normandy that they should absolutely go. Thank you again for the work you do, not just to promote cider, but information sharing within the industry that helps us all move forward and keeps cider going up. Cheers, David, Associate Cider Maker at Albemarle Cider Works. Thank you, David, so much for taking the time to write and for your patronage to Cider Chat. It really means the world. And without the support of you and other patrons and commercial makers at the Cider Chat Patreon page, I wouldn't be able to produce this podcast and share it every week. So you are in turn doing a phenomenal service to your fellow cider makers out there, many of which I know are listening right now. And while I'm at it and talking about you and Abermile Cider Works, where you work with Chuck Shelton, I'd like to add that Chuck Shelton recently made a donation to Cider Chat, too. So I don't know. Is is it because I always have Virginia on my mind? I don't know. (laughs) Because I want to say that CiderCon was one of the best. I just love that venue. I love the scene. I love the cider in Virginia, the people. Mm, Yeah. So good people, good heart. I got to take a pause here and a little sip of cider because, you know, it's all about good cheer. Strange apples, bitter shop. Strange apples. Making cider is all about apples having the perfect blend or the specific apple variety that you only want to ferment and yeast yes yeast yeast is what transforms the sugar in the apples into alcohol and the yeast can really inform the cider whether you want a really dry cider or a very sweet cider the yeast can help you get there and one of our sponsors for this here podcast 
provides yeast and fermentation solutions for cider makers and winemakers. And that would be Fermentus. You could check them out at Fermentus.com. Now, with that said, I'm going to be recording an interview with Fermentus probably in June with a tech. And I've been asking for questions. And recently, we just got a question in from Alan, who lives in Portland, Oregon. And this will give you an idea of what kind of questions people are asking. He wonders if people ever use a yeast that is called Saccharomyces boulardii as a cider yeast. Well, Alan, I can't say that I know anyone offhand using Saccharomyces boulardii, but that doesn't mean that it hasn't been done. So if you out there in Ciderville use this particular yeast strain and have experimented with it, please let us know. And in the meanwhile, I'm going to be queuing up that question for the upcoming recording with the tech from Fermentus this June. If you, like Alan, have a question or an answer to any of the questions being asked on this podcast, please send all queries and answers and pearls of cosmic wisdom my way to info at ciderchat.com. Strange apples, juice and rap. It's time now for our featured conversation with Alan Supernot of Brook Farm Orchard in Ashfield, Massachusetts, which is around about my special spot of Ciderville. So I actually did this recording at his home, which sits right next to his orchard. It was Alan who first reached out to me and let me know about Michael's passing. And I tell you, it was a shocker. I, I couldn't believe it. And I could definitely tell that Alan was even beyond belief to where I was because they had such a, a kindred spirit relationship uh, over the years. And we're going to be hearing a bit about that. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, when you're talking about somebody and you have this undeniable passion towards teaching about apples, well, we sway there quite a bit too. So there's a lot of good bonus tips in here about growing your own apples and how to nurture them along the way. So let's all grab a glass raise it high to Michael Phillips, and join this chat with myself and Alan Supernot of Brook Farm Orchards in Ashfield, Massachusetts. I was giving a NOFA workshop 30-some-odd years ago about simple living and growing your own food and tax resistance and in comes Michael Phillips at the end and walks up to me and says, I'm Michael Phillips. We need to get to know each other. He was there the whole time. I didn't know him before that. And um, that's where we met. And that was down in uh, Hampshire College in Amherst, Mass, when they used to have the annual conference there. And since then, our families have enjoyed each other, visiting here and visiting up there. And many times Michael would stay over here on his way further south for doing consultations and stuff like that. And this would be a place to get together and, and do that. And then he was coming down for Cider Days. So we mm -hmm. always got together then and um, mm -hmm. figured this out recently. 1990, the Small Farms Institute, which is in Belchertown, Massachusetts at that time, was doing four working groups of people who grew stuff that was sold retail, dealing with the challenges of organics. So they were strawberries, perennial greenhouse crops, sweet corn that we all love to eat, and mm -hmm. apples. The apple part was convened by Margaret Christie, who is now at CESA and been at CESA for quite a while, and another woman named Alex Stone. And they just got in contact with all the apple growers they knew and we came together. Michael was not there at that time, but two years later he joined in because he saw what all the cool kids were doing and he wanted to be with the cool kids table and here he was. He just came <laughs> in and <laughs> got to do that. So that's when the Ber what we call the Berkshire Round Table started from the Small Farms Institute kind of intention there that we did. And, um, yeah. We were at Rowe Conference Center for a few years, and then we moved mm -hmm. to Stump Sprouts. 
-hmm. And that was 32 years ago when that started. And we're still going. We're not government funded. We don't invite academics. Mm -hmm. We did that a couple of times. It was kind of a bummer. Uh Because they came to tell us what was going on, and Uh we all felt like we had as much that we could share. We this part of this meeting is every no one plays close to the close to the vest. We share things, and we don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of um, extension meetings I used to go to when I worked for a commercial apple grower was, you didn't want to share everything because Mm -hmm. that guy might do better than you. If you shared what you were doing, it worked. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, and that's not what we were about. We were the opposite of that. And mm. it's still true. Mm-hmm. People do their own research, and every year we go through what people have learned. Was yeah. that always organized by Michael? Um, no, so it's really, it really did start with the Small Farms Institute. Okay. And then one day Michael said, I'll facilitate. Okay. And then all of a sudden he became the organizer of it. And he dovetailed it with his consultation business and his own research and Mm -hmm. his own orchard. Um, Mm -hmm. So all got mixed together. And um, it was a smaller number of people initially. And now it's 45 regular folks that come from North Carolina to Maine to upstate New York, from Quebec. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. And so Michael had actually asked to transfer that to somebody else, somebody younger, the facilitation part. Recently. Last year. Last yeah. year, wow. And apparently, he now he has transferred it. Mm-hmm. And um, the group has probably a third younger people under 30 now, which is really exciting to me. Mm-hmm. And I feel like, I feel really, my heart feels really good when I think about that because these people mm-hmm. are going to carry it on. Mm-hmm. And they get it. They get the tree, they get the tree time, mm-hmm. they get what this is about. And a bunch of them make cider. And that's a good too. thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Redbird cider, yeah. Um, South Hill cider. Yeah. Um, Claude nice. Jolie Cook comes down from Quebec. So um, there you have the author of the. Uh, yeah, of course, the, another cider book. Yeah, yeah the yeah. Cider Maker Handbook. Yeah, you mentioned Eric at uh, Redbird. Yeah. And then um, Steve C. Lynette. Yeah. South Hill. Yeah. Andy Brennan. Andy Brennan, yeah. yeah. Your your relationship with Michael extended mm-hmm. beyond that. Yeah. But yeah, we were um, soulmates. Um, and as I said earlier, when you see a soulmate, you look in their eyes, you both know it already. You mm-hmm. don't have to mm-hmm. really verbalize mm-hmm. it. And where he lived, he lives up by the Connecticut River, where it's kind of like you can jump across it. Yeah. So we're talking we about northern, down, northern New England yeah, up in... Northern um, New Hampshire, yeah. In, uh, New yep, Hampshire, near, yeah. Up near the Quebec border. Right. And we live where the river is a little bit wider. Yeah, you don't want to necessarily <laughs> right. cross it without a life preserver. Right. So we didn't... Yeah. Um, so we saw each other a couple times a year. Once was always in the March meeting. Mm-hmm. And then um, usually a summer visit would happen mm-hmm. between our families. Mm-hmm. I helped them raise their barn mm-hmm. uh, the same weekend that they adopted their daughter. Nancy went to Alaska, and Michael raised the barn. And when Nancy came back with Grace, there was a barn. Beautiful. <laughs> How these things work out. You know, she gets a phone call, and it's time to go. And she got on a plane, and she went. Now, and, you have an orchard right outside your home here. And I'm wondering if you had Michael on speed dial for mm-hmm. orchard care. Because, I mean, he, he wrote, you know, two books right. on the topic. <laughs> yeah. Right here. Right here. <laughs> right here. Plus, right. So here's a term of Michael. We changed this. That, so my idea was to call it Michael Rise Eye. So okay. that's a new, I haven't trademarked it yet, and I don't think I need to, but. <laughs> Michael Rise Eye. Yeah. So the book that Alan's talking about here, written by Michael Phillips. Yeah, I'm, Michael Reisel. M- Michael Reisel. Planet. Planet. So it's all what's going on underneath the trees and mm-hmm. the root systems. All about the, the fungi. Yeah. And uh, so the subtitle is how, how Symbiotic Fungi Work with Roots to Support Planet Health and Build Soil Fertility. So he had this book, and then he's also he got, so well known. That was his first for, one. For the apple grower, yeah, which has this beautiful photo of him in the apple tree. Right. And, and then, so this was more towards grower, actual commercial growers. Mm-hmm. This one showed more of his understanding of holistic orcharding also mm-hmm. with a bent towards home owners. Mm-hmm. So somebody has four or five trees, 
mm -hmm. uh, wants to get fruit that they can actually eat mm -hmm. and get reinforced by that process of mm -hmm. eating, which is why I teach to the homeowners because I want people to not just look at the Miller's catalog and see the beautiful apple, but to figure out how to do it mm -hmm. and have it so that you can enjoy it. And then that positively reinforces you into doing the other things you need to do, pruning, mm -hmm. thinning, mm -hmm. fertilization, that, that sort of thing on a yearly basis and not just forget about them and say, oh, my tree never gave me good fruit. And homeowners aren't focused like commercial growers are on the tree, but they want to figure out how to have something. Yeah. And, um, and I love teaching people how to do that. I love watching the lights go off and people sit and go, mm. wow, that's really cool. Okay, I can do that. Mm. And then we graft trees here and they take a tree home mm. with them. And Beautiful. all of us, you know, from Michael on down, we have orchards that are so full of different varieties, just like the planet. There's a lot of different people, there's a lot of different apples. Mm -hmm. And in an orchard, they all kind of work together just mm -hmm. fine, mm -hmm. as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think that this is like a critical moment, kind of in the time where people are getting like a, a resurgence of mm -hmm. interest in apple trees. <sighs> Seriously, and, COVID. And COVID, yeah. We call them pandemic planters. That's not oh, my term. Oh, okay, that works. That was from St. Lawrence Nurseries, uh -huh. one of the people who works there. Another silver lining of the pandemic then. Apparently, right? yeah. yeah. It's, I'm, I'm good with that. Fedco tree sells out now. Yeah, and that's a beautiful yeah, thing. it is. <laughs> yeah. And so here you have all these folks planting apple trees. And what happens is they start growing and then they got to be pruned. Right. You know, and so I often thought about Michael Phillips in that way in his book as a resource for, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. folks. And yeah. of course, now, you know, what you're doing too. Um, so let's just kind of talk about that. Like, what, what would you say, what would Michael say about, you know, somebody who's like kind of getting into mm -hmm. an apple tree the first, first time? Here we are. It's March when we're recording right. this. Right. Um, this is a rather critical time right now for people to get out and prune their mm -hmm. apple trees. What's your, what's your advice about that? Um, so Michael and I would both say that we learned from old Yankees that you prune a standard sized tree so you can throw a cow through it. Right. So you want light because light is critical to bud formation and it's critical for ripening and it's critical for airflow. So with airflow, you don't get fungal diseases as much, depending on the variety, of course. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the light allows the buds to form each year, and then you have to combine that with thinning so that you don't have too much bud formation if you would like a repeat. And my friend Andy would say that, well, you'd want to... That's us doing that. The trees really want to be biennial. And so his cider is more based on that mm -hmm. in the trees that he harvests from mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to thin them. Mm -hmm. um, but he also doesn't smell, sell at a, um, retail at farmer's markets. No, he doesn't. And yeah. a bunch of us do, so that's why we thin. Because uh -huh. you want to have return. You can't. Th there are biennial trees that you can th thin in such a way, combined with pruning, that you get a return bloom it's less, but like a Baldwin. So I have a tree that I can get 12 bushels on in a good year and three in a bad year. But I'm getting three, I'm not getting zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I've done a certain horticultural tricks to do that. What's so, the trick to that? Well, one of it is um, taking the, the one-year shoots uh -huh. and bending them underneath a limb. And you can hold them with a, you know, you can just, if you bend them right now, because they'll bend now. Mm -hmm. In the spring. They'll just stay. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, some people talk about putting uh, clothespins or something to hold them, but you don't mm -hmm. really need to do that. You can just, you can save one, one mm -hmm. of the last year's shoots, mm -hmm. and just bend it under and around. Mm -hmm. And then that becomes your new wood. And in a couple of years, you prune out the old lateral, and now you have a new lateral mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. new buds. And that allows like I said, the Baldwin or the Northern Spy, something that's heavily biennial, to give you something, 30% maybe, on mm -hmm. the off years. I got that information from listening to Hugh Williams talk, who is, has Threshold Farm out in Philmont, New mm -hmm. York. And he said, no, just do it this way. 
Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, and it's working. Yeah. Yeah. And John Bunker comes in and he chimes in and says, I do it with clothespins. And Hugh says, oh, there, you don't need clothespins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's too difficult. <laughs> you just bend it underneath. And, mm -hmm. you know, Hugh was right. <laughs> I want to go back to what you said about pruning a tree so you could throw a cow through. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, folks listening right now, you know, will think a cow is you know, a one-ton beast, right? Yeah, it's hard to throw. You're hard too, to th right? And hard yeah. to throw. That yeah. ain't too easy. So, yeah. you know, and looking at your trees out the window here, mm -hmm. I, I would be, I'd be hard-pressed to be able to throw a, a cow, but I probably could push a <laughs> cat through maybe who would land a lot better than a cow. Right, right. So it's right. not really Just like... cats land on their feet. <laughs> yeah. So we don't want to, like, give people the idea right. uh, that, you know, you're just cropping the heck out of a tree mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's it's just like a big empty hole there right so i mean that is the finesse of a pruning pruning is it? an art it is it's definitely an art and it can be an art for what you want to get from it so all these trees are on antonovka rootstock which mm. is a standard size rootstock mm -hmm. because i have heavy clay soil and i could if i planted dwarfs i wouldn't be able to they probably wouldn't survive yeah. i want these these trees can make it 100 years and they're 30 years old now. Higher up on the hill are trees I haven't taken the central leader out of and down here what you're seeing is the central leader has been taken out down to the first set of scaffolds mm -hmm. and then I'm training another leader inside a smaller one. So I'm trying to create a dwarf orchard on standard rootstock. Those trees would get you know they could get like 30 feet yes. high easily yeah. and, and, and that's where homeowners get mm -hmm. into the problem because right. they have now these unwieldy trees yeah. they're looking at now getting an apple and if you skip ladder. them one year or skip them oh, two it's years overwhelming. all of a sudden yeah if you were starting off with a standard tree mm -hmm. let's say somebody picks up a you know a, a tree they're not necessarily doing what we're doing grafting or anything and they hear it's a standard tree what would your be ad advice be for somebody starting off with a standard tree like that if they wanted a standard tree, I would just say... That, then keeping it small, small. keeping it low. Yeah. yeah, you want to be pruning it from the first year on. You want to be pruning to have horizontal limbs because fruit buds form on horizontal limbs and not on the vertical limbs. Mm -hmm. um, you can create that on a young tree easily with, with um, clothespins or spreaders that you can make yourself, or you can buy spreaders if you want. Mm -hmm. um, a center leader, no center leader? A center leader you, will come from that automatically. Yeah. yeah. So, so you head it back maybe 10 inches from the top of whatever it grows to. At what height would you cut that back? So the tree's grown up. Let's say it's... Year three? Let's say it's, yeah. Yeah, and you okay. head it back. And what you've done is then you've changed how the life force moves within the tree and that it will then sprout some of those fruit buds or leaf buds that are already formed. They actually technically would be leaf buds that then would form a side branch. And then mm -hmm. you keep those that you want. At three feet or so, now that we don't have as much snow as we used to. So you might want to have three on one scaffold. That would be your first scaffold, so three different directions. Okay. Spread out as much as you can within the compass. And then once you've headed that down, some side shoots will come maybe 10 inches below that. Mm -hmm. And that can be your second scaffold, but you want maybe two and a half, three feet between Before scaffolds. Each one for that airflow. Yeah. For that little cow. Yeah. And then you just keep here. that. Yeah. So you have, so they're not going to move up as the tree grows. That doesn't work that way. And mm -hmm. most, some people, it's hard to conceive that it actually mm -hmm. stays right where it is. The tree adds mass, but it goes up on its new wood. So then the second scaffold will stay there. And then you just keep heading it back down. Topping top. it off, yeah. topping it off as yeah. you go, yeah. so it doesn't get really unwieldy. And right. that would make right. it easier so for... So Antonovkas can grow to 12 feet. These yeah. were never more than 12 or 13 feet. Yeah. Even before I took them down, they yeah. were that. And um, like I said, higher up, I've, I've left some of them because the soil is different, terroir. And mm -hmm. the trees grew less vigorously higher up. I didn't take the centers out because I want that volume of apples to have for the farmer's market. What about the spacing of your trees here? They're well, about 25 feet. 25 feet? In, in row. In row. And 20 feet across. Would you so, do that any differently now? Um, the only thing I would really do differently is pick some different varieties, some that I wasn't as happy with. Oh. I picked a lot of varieties that were um, scab resistant, Okay. Or, so lower fungal, so trying to eliminate the fung um, the 
fungicide part mm -hmm. of the spray program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some of them are um, old apples because they're not that great. And that's why people don't grow them anymore. Uh, and what you know? are those varieties that you're talking about? Oh. Dud that you, that Dudley, you wouldn't grow? Dudley Wormless. Um, boy, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. That's I'm, not one you hear too often. Right, right. <laughs> and so I've grafted a number of them over. They're not all coming to mind right at the second, okay. which ones I grafted over, but just trying to change to things like a black Oxford, okay. which is really popular Beautiful among apple, people. Yeah. yeah. Um, what are the other ones? How does the Baldwin grow here? The Baldwin grows really good. So these two Baldwins came from David Gott. David oh. Gott grafted them for me, and I bought the trees from Dave. I didn't know David. It's a Gott. small world. Yeah, yeah. lovely yeah, guy. Yeah, Dave did a lot of that. He is. Yeah, he is. good yeah. friend. A lot of history there. We used to have a cider business together, actually. He and I, and a couple other people. Yeah, I, South Shelburne Sweet Cider. I yeah. remember when he it was like in the little glass um, jars, right? Yeah. The little candy yeah. jars. Yeah, he did that the first year. We. Some of us convinced them that we could go to plastic. <laughs> oh, I, did. I never yeah. saw that when it went to plastic, yeah. but yeah, yeah he is just one heck of a, a yeah. good, good banjo player, too. Yeah. He's a very passionate. Yeah, he sure is. He sure is. Passionate apple grower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So can we talk a little bit about Michael's Orchard? Because sure. I've never yeah. been there. And, and so, can you give us like a visual of what yeah. that looks like? So one of the visuals are you come off the main road in Los, a part of New Hampshire. It's called Lost Nation. There's also a part of Vermont that mirrors that called Lost Nation, too. So the whole thing was above the White Mountains and most of the Green Mountains and was basically its own thing for a long time. And it wasn't quite Canada, but it wasn't really the U.S. of A. Mm -hmm. anymore mm -hmm. up there. Mm -hmm. It was a different thing. And you come down this long driveway, downhill, and I keep thinking, what do you do in the wintertime? Yeah. So in the first year they were there... They didn't do. They just sledded down to oh their house. Oh my goodness! Wow. Put the baby. That's hardy. <laughs> but we were all younger. Right. I, <laughs> so, so the baby, the groceries, get on a sled sure. choop, down the. <laughs> Make and, life fun. Right. And you come down, and it opens up into this bowl, and the house is in the middle of the bowl, an old farmhouse that Michael worked on for years. And one of our work parties this spring is Nancy's finally going to get it sided. Because mm, mm. Michael never quite got he he did so much to this place in he terms had his of insulating hands and yeah. yeah putting in a good wood heat system and yeah. built a greenhouse on it and all this stuff but Nancy always felt like oh, I wish that was sighted there are there's a hill above the house that you just came down so off to the side there are maybe fifty apple trees right by the house that came with the old farm was a Duchess apple. Below the house were some of their gardens where they grew garlic and they did produce for a while. Mm -hmm. And also below the house is the barn that I mentioned before that we helped mm. raise. He was building, Michael was in the process of building a cidery onto that. He had built quite a bit of it, added on post and beam. He was wanted, it going to be a commercial cidery? Was he that wanted to goal? have like a little speakeasy down in the nice. basement. And he had yeah. a nice window on the basement side. You come in the bottom. The apples come in from the top. The cidery is right there. Perfect. Yeah, the barrels are right there, wow. and he had stu he had you know bar and stools all, so he's almost done with that, mm -hmm. and so that might be another work project that happens mm -hmm. to finish that up. And he was always selling like cider shares, like a CSA, but with mm -hmm. cider, and mm -hmm. he also did that with the farm with the apples. Mm -hmm. And then below the house on the other side, they built a beautiful yurt that Nancy teaches her herbal classes in and yoga classes. And so Michael did do that. He didn't get the house sided, but he, you know what I mean? So there, it's, 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 it's only like so all you, of us out yeah, here. It's only so you know, much same you can thing. Do. Yeah, right. you do what you can. Right. He wrote three books for God's right. sake. You know? yeah, well, there, there was that too. <laughs> <laughs> that took a little bit of time. <laughs> so on either side of that yurt are two other blocks of trees. Uh -huh. And they're younger than the trees above the house. And that's where he was dealing with the deer. Um, was in the uh, lower part. He had fencing all around it and every, you know, deer fence and like stuff. Like nine foot fencing? Yeah. Or something. And yeah. one year he had a moose come crashing through it, oh, dear. got stuck in it, and then went <gasps> oh. out a different part. Oh my gosh. And then let the deer in. 
because the moose killed the power and, you know, oh moose goodness. made it out. Wow. But the deer came in and, yeah, did it unto damage. What was he using for, or what does he, you know, what's up there for fencing? Um, the standard deer fence at the angle. The like four, the plastic fence? The no, fence? like it's, it's electric and it goes uh, off okay. nine feet at an angle out. So ho- hoping that they can't jump over, the deer yeah, won't jump over that. Yeah, Deteers But when the, noose mo- the moose knocked it over, <laughs> there's yeah. nothing to jump over. Right. They just walk right in. There may be... 400 trees all together up mm-hmm, there mm-hmm. and um, in that nice little bowl. This was an unexpected de- death. Yep. Um, yep. He obviously had plans and yep. was... He was still living them. Yeah, yep. he was working on, you know, another writing piece. He was piece. another yep. book, yeah. Like, do you know how he actually got... So in- he picked apples in New Zealand in the 70s mm-hmm. and had a bunch of friends there. And then he came back and he picked here along the Connecticut River. I can't remember the name of all the different orchards. One's in New Hampshire. Um, it's changed names a couple of times. Anyways, um, and the other part is what I learned just this year at the growers meeting was that Michael emailed everybody. He just had conversations because everybody was like, oh yeah, I was just talking to him. Oh yeah, I was just talking to him. And huh. that in that grower circle, but also in the uh, um, Holistic Orchard Forum that he has, the HON Forum. And some of those people were his clients, from, from and other people were just uh, interested in asking different questions. And some were, were homeowners, and a, and a lot of them were orchardists, and a lot of interest, as you know, in cider, mm-hmm. in cider mm-hmm. orchards mm-hmm. and planting that. And, yeah, so that that was the thing that, struck me the most at this meeting was that he was so, he and I were kind of each other's I don't know we just joked with each other all the time last time he was giving me a hard time about never sitting next to him at the growers meeting <laughs> and I told him well you know why I don't ever sit because I don't want the conversation in when you're a group facilitator to have everybody looking one way so there's a couple other people who always sat next to him I would sit opposite just to have him have a little balance in yeah the room. so people sure. so this new term at this meeting from a young woman that works with mike bilton and named cat was og which was original or old gangsta or all kinds mm-hmm. of these other things mm-hmm. and so we i wanted to consciously spread the ogs around the circle when you have 45 people it's very easy to make it look like a presentation and michael was not giving the presentation the other gentlemen were Michael was really good at asking a question and listening. Mm-hmm. And he had a lot of knowledge, but he would listen because mm. that's how you knew that. That's how you learn. Yeah. By listening, yeah. not by talking. That's true. That's true. Now, folks. As I talk away here. <laughs> you're doing great, man. You're doing great. Now, you know, visually, he was a, a formidable man. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. he's tall. I mean, I'm 5'7, so. Mm-hmm. He was probably six something. Yeah, he's six two, six yeah, three. Six yeah, six two. Yeah, yeah, which always feels really towering to me. Yeah. and you know, has his like big uh, yeah. mustache and yeah. that kind of would come down. Yeah, Santa Claus. We like call a Santa him. Claus. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and always yeah. had this like little like cap. Yeah. On his head. Yeah. And um. So we said some angels are dressed like bears. So there yeah. was an angel there that looked like a bear. Sure is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The moment when cider came out, did that surprise him? You know, when it really started hitting, because I know he's been involved. He's like one of the first presenters at Cider Days. Right. So Cider also became an offshoot of the Berkshire Roundtable, where a whole other cider meeting started forming from the members who were growing apples that were also hard cider makers. Or I want to just say cider now, because I want that word back. I don't want hard cider. We want cedra. You know, this is what we're talking about. And... He came down to Cider Days around just giving workshops about um, apple growing mm-hmm. for people, for homeowners or whoever mm-hmm. was interested. Mm-hmm. And he, he spoke here. I, I, I pressed cider here during Cider Days. He spoke up at Bear Swamp Orchard, Stephen mm-hmm. Jen's, your favorite place in New Salem. Uh, yeah, New yeah, Salem Preserves. Yeah. 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 yeah, when we were based in Shelburne Falls, he came down and talked there and up in Colerain at yeah. the church and mm-hmm. stuff. And he... Um, consulted with Terry and Judith Maloney. Well, West County West Cider. West County Cider, yeah. yeah. Losing Terry was 
kind of the last big loss in this community. And mm-hmm. now Michael, you know, mm-hmm. the rest of us are still hanging in there. It's hard yeah. when you lose major icons <clears throat> yeah. of a community. Yeah. And I would say Michael Phillips is one of them yeah. that transcends just outside of New England, but right. nationally. Yeah. yeah, he had a wide reach of uh, so both coasts and certainly did. in between. Yeah. yeah, and what a gift he did writing the holistic yeah. orchard. I still mm. don't believe it. I mean, it's settled in, but it hasn't settled in yeah, at the same it, time, it, you know. Such things can't. Yeah. Takes, it takes You know, time. I read this book, and I'm thinking, oh, he thanked me for being a biodynamic grower in the book. I didn't even see that the first time in this holistic <laughs> thing. You know, it was just like, I didn't even see it in the forward, you know. Wow. Today I saw her, and it started making me cry, mm, you know. And mm. there's just these other connections that he mm. was very good at connecting to a lot of people, mm-hmm. being the web, mm. being the web he talked about with the fungi world. Mm, the original it? internet mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah the yeah. legacy yeah a, a huge legacy yeah. for folks who don't know michael who are listening on the other side of the world mm. right now i would encourage them to get his books yep, definitely. but also in tribute they're asking to plant a, a tree and yeah if people to plant a tree for him in mm-hmm. his name i took one of my varieties a stark that i got from john bunker and pruned it the day michael died that i mm. learned and it's now it's going to be michael's tree Mm. That's the first one you see when you drive in. Mm, nice. And that's, yeah, it's going to be that, because I went up and just talked to him while nice. I was pruning. Yeah, it means a lot that yeah. way. Yeah. yeah. Well, we do hope people do plant more trees, because mm-hmm. we need them. And having a tree named Michael is a great thing, yeah. because yeah. it's somebody like this that made us, I believe in this country, where we are today mm-hmm. for our our knowledge bank and our resources we couldn't have been there without right. poor folks like michael right. phillips and it snowballs it. off it's one person totally. does this and somebody else does something yeah. else and then they talk to each other mm-hmm. and then something else happens from that and mm-hmm. michael was doing sap analysis was the most recent thing of the different stages of how the sap changes during the growing year so maybe it's one way when the buds are forming one mm. way when it's dormant, mm-hmm. one way when they've pollinated, mm-hmm. one way when they're growing in the summer, another way when the fruit is finished and, mm. the, and the bud, fruit bud abscesses from the, the stem to the, from the bud. And he was really interested in that to figure out, kind of like Rudolf Steiner was, of figuring, combining the Western and the, here I would say holistic way of so using mm-hmm, science, mm-hmm. but trying to show something else, the whole systems, mm-hmm. through science that some people can relate to easier. So he was working on how the sap is different, to the, and also to know what the tree might need from you at that point, whether it be a nettle spray. So Michael based, was, based upon the sap? Yes, huh. the sap analysis. But he, that's just, that work was just in the beginning. Uh, I don't even know about his notes. They may be in his computer. Uh, I'm not sure about that was at and he was trying to bring other people that knew more about that science into it so he could yeah. ask them questions yeah. about that and yeah he did many things really close to biodynamics yeah from his sprays that he used in the nettle teas mm-hmm. and equisetum and compost and mm-hmm. you know um, and he was slowly he was almost there i was trying to get him to do the preparations in his compost that he fed his trees we didn't quite get there yet <laughs> but we had him and everything else that's okay and, and he got it he even put steiner's picture in his oh. slide presentation oh nice nice <laughs> yes and rudolf steiner for folks who don't know was really a, a clairvoyant who who brought in the whole idea of anthroposophical teachings yeah and biodynamic and to make a farm self-supporting yeah not bringing in outside inputs as much as he said you'll never reach that goal but you want to always strive for that goal so if you can grow something like comfrey, Michael talks about comfrey, high in calcium, you make comfrey tea, which is just a cold tea, and then spray that on, or grow comfrey underneath your trees. And then when the comfrey dies, which it does, it takes out the weeds underneath your trees, the weeds which are also good, mm-hmm. but, it, but it lays down, and then the calcium becomes part of the feeding for, mm-hmm. the, for the roots to mm-hmm. the tree. And it's right in place. Or gra- uh, daffodils and keeping voles away with daffodil buds, uh, the, the um, bulb underneath the ground it repels them and they may go somewhere else. A whole other level of integrated pest yeah, management yeah. that brings it to this 
really like elevated level that isn't just um, disconnected, but it's really integral right. to the entire network. You're working with the systems that already exist in nature. Yeah, yeah, And you're absolutely. just trying to understand them and work with them. Did he have a favorite apple, uh, an affection towards one? <laughs> so Michael would say that whatever apple he was eating, which we all use that as, mm -hmm. a, as an answer to that question. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he really looked for apples that didn't need fungicides as much as some disease resistance and those aren't all the new university bred apples there are actually a lot of older apples that are very disease resistant too mm -hmm. and it turns out those apples the older apples are actually more disease resistant across lots of diseases the university ones are specific to a certain gene the the v the VF1 thing for the Liberty trees and mm -hmm. scab, but but then they get something else like frog eye leaf spot or where a Baldwin or something even further back than that, a russet doesn't get that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so he would say that about his, yeah. his favorite apple. Michael planted his orchard like I did here, right where you live. That regulates your choices. You raise children here. I raised a couple of kids here. My uncle raised Grace. You don't go spraying stuff that you know is not good because you live here. And you don't want your kids running around in it. And you don't want your friends running around in it. You don't want yourself running around in mm -hmm. it. And I worked in a commercial orchard for a while and I don't, I ate enough spray. I don't, that's how mm -hmm. I got to this. I mm -hmm. don't want to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. I learned, like, medical doctors who become homeopaths. I learned how you do it that way. And then I learned there's other ways to do it too. So I can apply a lot of the knowledge from commercial orcharding. Many things are the same. How you thin a tree, how you pick apples, how you store them, how you tractor them. You know, all those things are all the same. Mm -hmm. How big is your ladder? How do you fix a ladder? You know, all that. But, but um, the other parts of what you put on the tree and what you put in the soil. So a lot of our sprays for the trees are to use the leaf area as a receptor for the tree as well as the soil. So you're also always doing something to the ground. But different soils, terroir, lock up different things. Heavy clay soil in a rainy season doesn't transfer a lot of that good stuff that's in the soil that you put on mm -hmm. to, to its feeder roots. So you need to add that to the leaf area and have it absorb it that way. So the tree still stays healthy. <laughs> Good stuff, man. Yeah. So at, here at your orchard, are you doing ongoing classes or is that more I ha seasonal? Um, I have been doing ongoing classes for about 15 years now. Okay. And um, mostly geared towards homeowners. And like Corey said before, we want to have two or three trees, but want to get the fruit from them. And we go out and we prune. And I ask which tree is okay to prune to the tree. The trees tell us. Golden Delicious are really easy, a very, um, they want to grow horizontal limbs, Golden Delicious do. And I personally love Golden Delicious. And it's a hard sell at the market because the Golden Delicious people that have the cardboard image of stuff grown in our favorite state in the western corner of the country. Mm -hmm. And once they take, and I just say, please, just take a slice, because I give slices at the market. And then they go, wow, and then they buy a bag. Because a real Golden, a golden Delicious that's grown biodynamically is a whole other, oh. this, these apples have soul. Yeah, yeah. So I'm digressing, but so we prune. No, it's good, man. I'm <laughs> digging it. <laughs> we prune, Please. you know, golden. Digress. We usually do golden delicious with people. Uh -huh. I have, you know, five of them. We just go out and I let everybody just go it, and they can't really hurt it. I'm not giving them the chainsaw, but mm -hmm. they, they have handsaws sure. and, um, sure. you know, clip felcos and stuff. And um, yeah. we do that. We graft trees. People bring home trees that they grafted themselves. I cut a bunch of scion wood this time of year, and they can pick. Mm -hmm. And they asked which ones, you know, ahead of time. And, um, yeah, we have meal together here, pre-COVID. And um, mm -hmm. it's just really nice. We make cider in the fall. And, uh, so originally, the classes I taught were four parts. You could do any part you wanted. But if you did the four, you did the four seasons. You did, so you, you see, you did pruning, 
grafting and early spring stuff and then you did picking and me made cider and then there was putting the orchard to bed for the winter and so I so I like one of the things that biodynamic growers do is fertilize before winter because the tree of the energy of the tree is going to go into the earth the whole earth breathes in so you do that and then you've also on the practical way eliminated one of your early spring tasks because there's so much to do in the spring. <laughs> and if you have a wet orchard, you can't really even get out in it with a, with a machine to bring your fertilizer out there and stuff. And, so, and then scale. I talk to people about scale. So there's 120 trees here. On, on how many acres? Two acres. Two acres, yeah, right. Yeah, two acres open. Um, in the growers group at the Berkshire Roundtable, we've talked about the... Ult- the Maybe the maximum being around 500 trees. For a... A a viable, economically viable farm. Okay. It takes more than one person. It would take a couple of people That would be doing that for a farmer's market. Yes. But not... Or CSA. Yeah. Yeah. So we're talking about eating fruit versus... Yes. Maybe a little bit of cider making on the side, but not a commercial. Yeah. Yeah. It would probably be just sweet cider um, for that. Yeah. But just that the economics of scale... Is also the economics of the farmer, and what can the farmer actually do, and not have to make these choices of spraying fungicide on all the apples you didn't pick that are on the ground. Now, mm-hmm. I don't, I do not blame the growers who do that. I'm not. It's just not a choice I want to make. They're growing 50 acres. They can't afford to pick them all up, pick up those drops, so they leave them. But they have. They need fungicide on them because they have disease in them if they lay on the ground because they because because they break down slowly. Just what di- disease is helping it break down. That's part of the cycle. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But they don't want it to jump back up into the tree when it rains, so they spray the ground with fungicide mm-hmm. more than just the tree. Right. The next year, so I you know so that's where the scale is. We can pick up all our drops if we're up to five hundred mm-hmm. trees, mm-hmm. and then either compost them or make cider with them, depending on the shape that they're in, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, yeah. So there's that part that I stress with the homeowner, too, that the, cl- the sanitation yeah. is part of your disease program, and then picking varieties that don't need as much fungicide. You still have to deal with certain pests. You can't eliminate that. But you can maybe grow a trap tree that somebody sprays the trap tree, but, and let's so, explain what you mean by a trap tree. So a trap tree would be a tree that blossoms early, would have set fruit a little bit earlier. So for one pest that we could talk about early on is plum curculio. When the apple is about the size of a quarter in a round, um, the plum curculio comes along and lays her egg in it. And that egg will then cause the tree to drop, cause the apple to drop onto the ground because it has a little larvae in it. And then the larvae come into the soil and then come back up again in the fall for the winter. And then they're back again next year. So you can interrupt that cycle by um, thinning, helps interrupt that cycle, and picking up all those drops that come in June drop. That's why it's called June drop, because the tree naturally sheds a certain amount of fruit. Because it has enough, because it wants to be able to mature all the seed. The tree doesn't care about what we care about. We care about this juicy apple. The tree just wants to make more seed. And so it can set a thousand apple, you know, more apples, and we may only want a hundred on that tree. But the tree also knows it can't do two thousand apples and, make, and bring the tree to maturity, to bring the seed to maturity. Mm-hmm. So it drops them in June drops. So, but also, the curculio are dropping then if they've stung the apple at the same time. So that's why you clean that all up. And then you can put it in a little pail and then burn it in a fire. But you don't want to compost it because they like that. They'll keep <laughs> they'll be back. Yeah. yeah, they'll be yeah. back. <laughs> so good, safe right. management of the orchard. Is, right. Uh, so a trap tree, and I got sidetracked, sorry. Yeah. It's all, there's so many So much, I'd love to keep yeah. going. Right, the trap tree will bloom earlier so it'll set fruit earlier. And so some commercial orchards and organic orchards are using that tree to attract the pests initially. So curculio over winter in leaf litter. So if you have orchards cleaned up, they'll do the leaf litter in the woods nearby at the edge of the orchard and then migrate in. 
So if the trap tree is where they migrate in, then you can spray the trap tree with whatever you want to use to try to kill them there. Whether it's surround and clay, and, or if it's uh, imidan or some other pesticide, to get them, and then you don't have to spray your, your trees as he- for on a commercial level. Then you wouldn't have to spray your trees as heavily because the pressure would be a lot lower mm-hmm. from that one. So then, so th- that could also apply with codling moth, and it could apply then with uh, apple maggot fly. Those are kind of the three that we really see the most of. Mm-hmm. Soft fly and a few other things are more minor. And this up here, um, Michael, bringing back to Michael, had something called apple curculio, which because the plum curculio could not survive in his northern mm. climate, but nature being nature, the apple curculio can survive, and it would do the same thing. It would get into the bark in the tree and and kind of girdle it around mm. and then kill it if you didn't control it. Right, right. You really <laughs> have to be on it. Right, right. So. Really do. Sometimes it feels like there's always something out there going after your trees. <laughs> <laughs> it does, it does. Do you have a trap tree in your orchard? Um, right now I don't. I've been using um, Surround, the clay spray uh-huh. from Cuculio. And you and spray that in the spring? That goes in the spring. It's very tricky to do in a wet spring because you want to get enough layers on to yeah. actually. And So what we think about is the Cuculio come in, they get clay on them, and they're like, oh, oh, I get this clay. And they spend all their time cleaning it off all their legs. Mm-hmm. I forget. They have six legs, I think. And so they don't always get around to laying eggs at that point. Because they're kept so yeah. busy cleaning yeah. themselves. And then they die because right. they're only a two-year cycle right. for the bug's life. Yeah. And um, um, so but that's a, more of a challenge and another expense. You're bringing in an input into your orchard you are. to do yeah. that. Like yeah. that. And um, it's time-consuming because... For folks who don't know what we're talking about, that's like going out and actually putting, like, uh, it's like a gray layer that you'll see at the base, the trunk of your tree going up. But how high do you put that up? Into uh, the whole tree you want to cover. The whole tree. Yeah, you yeah. want to cover. And a lot of your neighbors will freak out because they what thought you, you were organic. Yeah. What are you doing? You, the tree, you, you know, and you'd have to do, and that's okay. You can do the education for your mm-hmm. neighbors, your customers. At the farmer's market. But if you get a lot of rain, you're up the creek without a paddle because right. that's what's going to take up right. off the clay. Right. It's a it, real hard, hard call. It's kind of so like So you want to get hay. like maybe three applications of the clay to be thick enough yeah. on the tree. And in spring, that's tough around right. here because rain is Right. Let's take constant. last year, for instance. You were able to do it? Okay, good. Well, fingers crossed. <laughs> right. Somehow right. the magic works. Very nice. And coddling moth. There are mating disruptives that you can buy for coddling moth that homeowners can buy them too and put them in their trees, and it confuses the male. What What do you recommend there? Um, I think just googling any coddling just googling moth. Just googling coddling moth. Yeah, pheromones. They're fer- yeah, pheromones. They're, fer- yeah. they're pheromones. Mm-hmm. They're little twist ties. You just put them on the trees. You really see them up out in trees. Yeah. 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 If you go into an and apple just maggot fly is that infamous red ball that Ron Procopy from Conway developed with his research assistants. One of them being Margaret Christie. Mm-hmm. Mentioned from CISA. So and that's like the big red apple ball that people see out in the orchard and right. wondering, what is that about? Are they putting an orna- a, a, a fake apple in right. the tree? And right. it's actually for pest <laughs> management. Yep, and you put a pine resin <laughs> sticky on it that's also organic. And some, some people use a little pheromone attractant, they hang above it. Some people feel like that brings in more apple maggot fly. Mm. Kind of like um, Japanese beetles, and they have those attractants. Some people feel like you're bringing in more to that area. Mm. Um, The trap captures are heavier with the pheromone than they are without, but without would still work. And when I use them here, because I have 45 varieties that ripen over a four-month period, I start with the earliest ripening and then just clean the trap and just keep moving them around so that I can really put three or four in a tree and... Not have any apple maggot damage. Just mm-hmm. once again, though, it's labor intensive. Once again, it's scale. Mm-hmm. Right, scaling too. If you have what twenty you have? acres, you may be harder to do. Fifty acres, yeah, almost impossible. Well, the average homeowner might have just one tree, right, and maybe up to three. Yep. So yep. that's pretty manageable. Yep. To to yep. do for all you, those things. That's why I, that's why I try to teach it that right. way. Right. Yeah. That's a can, tough one. And once you get the apple, and it's really good. 
you know, next year you'll say, oh, I can do those things. That wasn't that much of a big deal. Where's my notes? Yeah. Because I encourage everybody has to keep an orchard journal. And I ask the question during the workshop. It's like, what is it you want, Rhea? Oh, I'll look at my orchard journal because I don't know what I did when next year when I don't remember because right. I went to the Cape for vacation. <laughs> I was with my kids. This other thing happened. They broke their leg. I don't remember what I did to that tree. That's so but wait, true. Here it is in my orchard right journal. Now. So yeah. I try to make a joke out of it in the classes just so that people will cool. do it. Cool. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's and it works for me. I mean, I do it. I mean, I've been doing it since. It's I just like cider, making cider. You've got to keep right. your journal because you won't remember how you made that batch. Sure. Yeah. And wanna... what was in it, maybe. or Yeah. yeah. And everybody always asks you uh -huh. what apples are in that cider. <laughs> and if you didn't write it down, you're like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> They're apples. <laughs> from, from this uh, right. pool. I like that. Yeah, no, that's good. <laughs> yeah, you got, you got to do that, no doubt. Yeah. Well, that's absolutely fascinating that yeah. you're, you're doing that and really helping people who need that help yeah. so badly. And I, I get so much energy back from doing it, too. I don't want to say it juices me, because that would be a bad pun, but I really enjoy doing <laughs> but it. But it works. <laughs> yeah, because I like, I, like I like to see the excitement yeah. that people have around fruit trees, because it's empowering. Here's something you can do to reclaim some of your food independence. Well, you did your friend proud. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate your cider chat. It's just, I love it. I paint houses in the summer and I drive propane truck in the winter. Mm -hmm. I listen to it all the time and I feel like I'm visiting with people I don't know and mm -hmm. people I do know mm -hmm. already and you go all over and it's great and all of a sudden I'm in France. Wow, this is cool. Wait, I'm in California again because Rhea <laughs> went back to California to see family and, and she talked to all these people that were, you know. <laughs> now I'm in Chicago, you know, and it's just great. What a legacy Michael Phillips has left, which is going to keep his memory alive for sure, because there wasn't just the two Apple books. There was a fungi book we talked about, and he also has a DVD that goes along with the book, The Holistic Orchard. He also co-wrote a book with his wife, Nancy. Just outstanding, just an outstanding tribute to the man. And, uh, you know, it tells you a lot about the person when you speak to their friends. And you knocked it out of the park, Alan. That, again, was Alan Supernut of Brook Farm Orchards. Follow him on Facebook at Brook Farm Orchards and on Instagram at Brook Farm Orchard. And if you're feeling a little hole in your, your soul right now, well, all I can do is say, plant a tree and fill that hole with some good apple love for generations to come. And with that, I leave you here. This is Rhea Wincaller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. like cider, we like palms, we love orchards, and having fun, there is a reason, there is a reason why we do it like this, oh yes there is, there is a reason why we do it like this, oh yes there is, there is a reason, reason why we drink it like this, oh yes there is, there is a reason. We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. We like cider, we like palms, we like orchards, having some fun. There is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh, yes, there is. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh, yes, there is. There is a reason why we drink it like this. Oh, yes, there is. There is a reason. We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. Oh, yeah. We, we like cider. Oh, yes, we do. We like palms. Oh, yes, we do. We love orchards, 
having some fun. There is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we drink it like this. We like walking down the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. Oh, yeah. We like cider. We like palm. Oh, yes, we do. We like orchards, having some fun. Yeah.